So far, we discussed how to obtain apipolar geometry from two views. But of course, it would be ideal to obtain both the camera pose and the 3D reconstruction directly by optimizing over many views of the scene in order to minimize the camera pose and 3D reconstruction error. And this is what we're going to cover now in these last two units. And the first technique that we're having a look at is so-called factorization um, from Tomasi and Canade introduced a very old technique, um, but very elegant mathematically and uh, in the basic form only applying to setups where um, we have a rough autographic projection. But there is some extensions of this technique that also work for perspective cameras. So how can we use more than two views for structure for motion? Let's assume that calligraphic W contains these image coordinates, contains image coordinates for features that are tracked across several frames. So here we have N frames or cameras, and P are the number of feature points. Let's say we have 100 features and they are tracked over 10 cameras. We assume here always full tracks. Every feature is visible in every camera. Given these observations, um, this is illustrated here, right here we have some features and here we have these feature tracks. And assuming autographic projection, our goal is now to recover both the camera motion and the structure jointly. The structure is the, 3D, the set of 3D points corresponding to the tracks that we have observed. And it turns out that we can do this in closed form solution for this very simplified set up with autographic projection and complete feature tracks. And there's some modifications of this algorithm that make it also applicable to perspective projection and to alleviate this strong, or to reduce this strong assumption of requiring the features being tracked across the entire sequence. And here's an illustration on the bottom. We have a sequence of images where we detect and track features, for instance, using the lift descriptor or by using a Lucas Canade feature tracker. And we get these, this is in the 2D space, we get these 2D image trajectories of this sphere that is rotating here. And then we are re reconstructing both the camera planes of these autographic cameras and the 3D structure in terms of the 3D points. How does this work? Well, under autographic projection, a 3D point maps to a pixel in frame, um, that should be I, in frame I, in the following way. Um, as it's an autographic projection here, what we do is we take that 3D point here and we subtract the uh, translation of the camera coordinate system with respect to the world origin. So this point is expressed in world coordinates. And by doing that, we're expressing that point in camera coordinates. So this is basically leading to this vector here, xp minus ti. This, is this point here now expressed in these blue camera coordinates. And then we simply need to project that point onto the axis of that coordinate system to get the x and y pixel location. So here's an illustration where we are projecting it now onto that plane by taking the projection onto that vector and onto that vector. And this gives us the x and the y coordinate for that point P in the plane, the image plane of frame i. Now, without loss of generality, we assume that the 3D coordinate system is at the center because there is an ambiguity here, right? We can um, always define the world coordinate system arbitrarily. So we need to define it somehow and we define it such that the 3D point cloud here is centered around this world coordinate system to remove that degree of freedom. 
This is an assumption that we do. Now let um, xip and yip denote the 2D location of the feature p in frame i. Centering the features per frame and collecting them yields the so-called measurement matrix. We are not only centering these points that we want to recover in 3D, to remove that ambiguity, but we're also centering the points in the image coordinates before actually doing something with them. So if this is the image that we observe for frame i, we're centering them such that they are zero mean. And this is expressed by these two equations here. And then we are taking these measurements and we're stacking them into a big matrix where now we have the x's and the y's. These are the two parts of the matrix here. And we have it for all frames n and for all points p. There's a complete matrix that contains all the measurements. Remark the tilde notation here denotes centered, not homogeneous coordinates. So we're using the same notation here, um, but this is inconsistent with the other lectures where we typically use it for homogeneous coordinates. Let me repeat, the tilde notation denotes centered, not homogeneous coordinates. Please keep that in mind. This is only for this unit. Okay, so x tilde ip are the centered x coordinates of point p in image i. Now, <clears throat> as we have this expression from before, the expression for projecting a 3D point onto the i image plane, the centered image x coordinate is given as follows. We have x tilde, this is the centered notation, which is xip minus the mean of all the 2D image features in that frame. Now we can plug this in here. So we have this expression here for xip, and we have this expression here for xiq. Now let's have a closer look at the second expression. So in the second expression, this term here does not depend on q, so we can pull it outside. And we can also um, pull uh, ui ti outside this expression here, this summation, because it also doesn't depend on q. So we get this expression here. Right. Now, um, we have uh, on the left hand side here, we have uit ti a negative, and on the right hand side, we have ui transpose ti positive. So these two terms cancel. And so we're left with ui xp minus ui uh, this expression, which we can summarize as ui transpose this expression here. Um, and because we have assumed that the 3D points are centered, this expression here is zero. So we obtain ui xp. So in summary, the centered image x coordinates, assuming centered 3D coordinates is x tilde ip is simply ui transpose xp, a very similar relation, a very simple relationship. And the same is also true. We obtain a similar equation for the y coordinate. So we have these two expressions, x i p, this is the u axis or the x axis of the um, i f camera coordinate system, and this is the v or y axis of the i f camera coordinate system. We have these simple linear projections to obtain the centered coordinates. Now we can collect all of the centered coordinates into a centered measurement matrix W tilde. Again, we use tilde here for denoting centering, not homogeneous coordinates. And we obtain a very simple linear system, which is W tilde equals Rx. But W tilde is now the centered image coordinates. So this matrix is the same as this matrix here. Um, and we have R, which is collecting the 
axis of the camera coordinate systems, u1, un, v1, vn. And we call this r because these are simply the rotations. This can be interpreted as a rotation matrix, right? This is just the, the rotation of the autographic camera coordinate system. Translation doesn't play a role because it's an autographic rotation. So we just have rotations here. And this is, um, these rotations are formed, are spanned by these basis vectors. And here we have the X matrix here on the right, which is collecting simply the uh, 3D points. We multiply these two together, we obtain W tilde, which is exactly corresponding to this element wise expression here on the top. So we have in this normalized representation found a very simple relationship here, a simple linear relationship that we have to solve now. Again, R represents the camera motion. In our case, because it's autographic, just rotation, and X the structure. And that's why it's called a structure from motion or sometimes structure and motion algorithm because we're trying to recover from the observations W alone, R and X together. Now, let's have a closer look at R and X. R is a 2n times 3 matrix because these basis vectors that span the camera coordinate systems are three dimensional vectors and they're stacked here into the rows of this R matrix. And X is a three times P matrix because we have P points where we, each of these points is a three dimensional vector. Therefore, in absence of noise, where this W tilde is exactly the product of R and X, we know that the matrix W tilde has at most rank three. And this is an important property that we are gonna use. Right? Because this matrix and this matrix have rank free maximally. Also, their product can only have maximally rank free. So it's a rank deficient matrix. However, when adding noise, the matrix, matrix easily becomes full rank. Um, so we have, we, we have to retrieve this rank free version of the full rank matrix by canceling the noise. So given real observations with full rank W hat, let's call it w hat here, because this is observations, we now have to find a rank free approximation w tilde to w hat. And we can do that by finding a matrix w tilde that's closest to w hat, but has only rank free. And it's closest to that in, in terms of the Frobenius norm, which is basically the L2 norm on matrices. And this can be done also by a singular value decomposition. So it can be, can be shown that you do singular value decomposition of w hat, um, and you consider the singular vectors corresponding to the top three singular values, and the others should anyways be small because they are just capturing the noise, then you're finding a matrix that's in the Frobenius sense is closest to the measurement matrix that you have actually observed. Right. So we do a singular value decomposition of the full rank matrix W hat into U sigma V transpose. And then we can obtain a rank free factorization by, take, by considering only the singular vectors and the singular values corresponding to the largest three singular values here in, in, in this factorization. The sigma becomes basically a three by three matrix. And then we can uh, simply obtain our hat as u sigma to the power of one half and x hat, um, which are estimates then as sigma one half um, v uh, transpose. Because if I multiply both together, um, I obtain u sigma v transpose. But now, because we have done this factorization and erased all the singular values and singular vectors that are um, not the top three, um, we obtain again a rank free factorization. See that sigma is three by three, v t is uh, three by p. So we, we're removing all the singular vectors that are, are not relevant. Unfortunately, this decomposition is not unique as there exists a matrix Q uh, three by three matrix Q, 
such that with an arbitrary matrix Q, we obtain the same W hat. If I look at W hat and I have the singular value decomposition here um, into R hat and X hat, then I can also multiply Q to R hat and Q power of minus one to X hat and I obtain the same W hat, but I have changed R hat and X hat. Another question is, well, how do we actually find the right R hat and X hat? So to find this Q, that is the right Q that we actually want, we observe that the rows of R are actually unit vectors. And the first half are orthogonal to the corresponding second half of R. Remember, R is, are the basis vectors that span the coordinate systems of this autographic projection. And they are orthogonal to each other, which means that if I multiply U with V, I get um, zero. And if I, and they are also unit vectors. So if I multiply U with U, I get one. And if I multiply V with V, I get one, right? So that means that if I take these vectors R and, and I multiply them together, U, T, U, U, T, Q, transpose, then that should be one. If I, if I transpose this expression, I get this expression here. This, this is called a metric constraint. It call, it's called a metric constraint because we, are, we know that this, the length of this u vector is one, must be one. So um, if we multiply this together here, then um, this must be one. And we should choose a q such um, that this, this becomes one. Um, and similar for v, and then also we have the cross term u times v, which must be zero. So we want this matrix such that these matrix constraints hold. And this is then our R that we are interested in from all the entire family of R's that we consider. Choice of Q. So these are the matrix constraints that we want to enforce. And this gives a large, a large set of linear equations for the entries in the matrix Q, Q transpose, as you can see here. It's linear in the entries of the matrix Q, Q transpose. This is considered as one matrix. And from there, the matrix Q can be recovered using standard Koleski decomposition, right? Because it's a, it's a Q, Q transpose decomposition problem. We can just solve using a standard algorithm. So now we have obtained um, we have obtained the Q, and from the Q we have a, we can obtain the R and the X that we are actually interested in, and so this solves our problem. And here's an overview over the algorithm summarizing it. We take measurements w hat that are not necessarily rank free because um, of measurement noise. So we compute the SVD of this and keep the top three singular va values and vectors. And then we define r hat as um, uh, and x hat as these expressions here. We compute then Q and Q transpose from, uh, uh, from, from this. Uh, and from there, we compute Q. And then our final R and our final, that should be X, are computed by multiplying this with Q. Some final remarks on this algorithm. Well, the advantage of this algorithm is, is obvious. It's a closed form solution, it's super fast, and it doesn't have any local minima. Um, and it's determined, that's not an advantage, that's in general true, it's determined up to an arbitrary global rotation because we can always rotate um, the world coordinate system and the cameras as well. The disadvantage is that it requires complete feature tracks. So if there is a feature that's not detected in one frame or if a feature like leaves the frame because of an occlusion, this basic form of the algorithm can't handle this. But there is uh, solutions for this. So the algorithm can be applied to subsets of features and frames and then propagate to some form of matrix completion iteratively to fill in the missing entries and still operate on the data. And actually the data that I've shown you before, the fear data has already this problem that not all features are visible in all frames. And this has been 
solved using such an iterative propagation scheme. And here's another example um, where this algorithm has been used for a reconstruction of this object here, including the hand, and then a 3D model has been returned by meshing the results. Remember that these are results from 1992. Right? So this is one of the very first multi-frame reconstruction approach. Mathematically very elegant, but assuming autography and requiring some additional effort if feature tracks are not complete. To summarize, uh, Tomasi and Canada's original factorization approach assume autography. And therefore, there have been a couple of extensions of this algorithm. For instance, the one by Christian Horan. Um, they perform an initial autographic reconstruction and then correct uh, the perspective effects in an iterative manner. There's also a follow-up uh, by Trix that performs projective factorization, iteratively updating the depth values. Now, even though these algorithms make some assumptions that make them inaccurate, factorization methods can still provide a good initialization for iterative techniques such as um, bundle adjustment gradient-based techniques such as bundle adjustment that minimize the reconstruction error, which is kind of the gold standard algorithm, but leading to a non-linear optimization problem that requires a good initialization. However, in modern structure for motion algorithms, like Colmap that we're going to discuss next, um, this is not how it works. It's not like it's using one of these multi-frame reconstruction approaches to get, a recon to get an initialization for the entire scene because this is it's still very difficult to do for not like tiny object-like scenes, but for very large scenes that we are interested in reconstruction, in, in reconstruction, in reconstructing, as um, even though you can do such an iterative procedure, it requires that still the majority of features is always visible in, in all of the frames. And in practice, this is simply not true. If you have very large scale reconstructions, an image is, showing only really a, a very partial view of the entire 3D object or scene that you want to reconstruct. And therefore, modern structure for motion approaches work slightly differently. They often perform what's called incremental bundle adjustment. They initialize with a carefully selected two view reconstruction, as we discussed in the second unit, and then iteratively add new images to the reconstruction and iteratively growing that reconstruction based on overlap between features detected in new images and features that are detected in images that are already part of the reconstruction. And that's what we're going to discuss also next unit.